Every day as we walk or jog along the roads of the country, every day as we drive on our way to work past homes built hundreds of years ago, as we sit in worship in our churches, do we ever imagine coming face to face with the myths and legends associated with these places? Over the years, stories of sightings stranger than reality have emerged from the quaint houses and rolling fields of the Washington County area. These stories, derived from the history of this area, were once told to eager audiences as forms of entertainment by storytellers. But now, these stories have been passed on to historians as a verbal record of the past. These stories date back to when Washington County was part of the Western Frontier and European settlers began making this area their home. The legends and myths of Washington County are all around us. They give us insight into what life was like long ago. It's some of these legends that we'll explore in this program. We'll visit the home of the founder of the city of Hagerstown, as well as the city itself. Then we'll head to South Mountain, near Boonesboro, to see the areas affected by the first battle of the Civil War fought on Union soil. It's all next on Legends. Every area in the county has its own history of ghost stories and legends that were handed down through the generations. Some were attempts to explain unusual phenomenon, while others were intended to amuse and frighten children around the fire at night. The tri-state area is rich in history and in myths and legends that are unique to this area alone. Each segment of this program will highlight an individual location or event as related by local residents and historians. We invite you to join us as we explore this unusual aspect of our local history. In her book, South Mountain Magic, Madeline Dahlgren describes the people of Zittlestown and their beliefs, their superstitions. But I think the most intriguing legend she describes is the legend of the black dog. The snarly yowl, as she says. It was kind of a dog demon. And many of the people of Zittlestown talk about seeing the dog. And here we are at the homestead of Wizard Zittle, the original log cabin of Glendale. Now, Wizard Zittle didn't mention anything about the black dog, but I think it's very intriguing that right across from the front of his house, across the old road, at the spring house is where most people sighted the black dog. And this is the old spring house at Glendale. It was here that most folks said that they saw the black dog. Most of the descriptions were the same. They said the black dog suddenly came down the old mountain path here, went right by the old spring house and then disappeared beyond in the mountains. And through the years, these descriptions were almost always the same. The dog was black, bigger than the average dog, ferocious looking. Sometimes the dog seemed to get bigger and then get smaller. Sometimes the dog seemed to have white spots that flashed. There was one gentleman that lived here by the name of Luke, and he describes the dog. He said, I was coming from Boonesboro one evening. It was late at night. I was hurrying home. He said it was all spooky here in the gorge. And he said, all of a sudden, right in front of me appeared the black dog. Couldn't even get by it. He said it was in the road and all of a sudden it got bigger. I tried to get around, but he said I had a shaft with me as I was walking. And he said, I tried to hit the dog and I slashed at it. And he said, 
that piece of wood just went right through the dog as if it weren't there. And he said, then all of a sudden, the dog disappeared. And this is the old path as it winds down through South Mountain. This same old path that the black dog followed, coming out here at Noah's Falls. And the stories say that the black dog often stopped right here in the little pool below Noah's Falls to have a drink of water. And Noah's Falls is just below the old National Pike. And it was here as the early travelers walked along the pike and as they drove the herds of cattle that they would often stop here to have a drink of water. And many are their tales about these travelers as they were stressed out here drinking the water and they were scared to look up but they heard the lapping of the black dog's tongue as the dog was refreshing itself. In fact, even today, a lot of the older folks reminisce about the tales of the black dog, talk about tales that their parents and different relatives have told them. I was born in 1899, and my parents were married, I think, in 1892. And before that, of course, uh, my father was courting my mother. And he lived in Frederick County, and she lived in Washington County. And he would ride horseback to a visitor. And one time, when he crossed the mountain at Dalgrens, he saw the black dog. And he said that it looked like an ordinary dog to start with, but then it began to grow. And it seemed to stretch halfway across the road. And, of course, he yelled at it. And when he did, it went up in a puff of smoke. I've never seen the dog, of course. I hope I never do. <laughs> but um, I've heard stories about it from different people. And I dare say any number of people saw it. They couldn't imagine a thing like that. It's been many years now since anyone has seen the black dog. But most of the local residents say the black dog is still around. It's just that people are buzzing by too quickly in their automobiles. They don't have time to see the dog. So the next time you're coming down South Mountain on the old National Pike, Slow down as you get near Noah's Falls. Look over here and see if you can see the black dog. We're here in beautiful Williamsport, a small town with a big history. Bordering the town is the surging Potomac River and the copious C and O Canal with a history all its own. Did you know that this little town was almost selected to be the U.S. capital? There's something else that remains here that so few people know about. It's the legend and memory of a mysterious lady found many, many years ago to wander the dark streets, alleys, and cemeteries of Williamsport. Her memory has faded with an era, an era when ghost tales were matter of fact, and those who didn't believe were very few. Listen to just a few of the local residents who explain their accounts of the days when the Vale Lady roamed the streets of Williamsport. The legend was that they had a veil over their face and uh, supposed to have been seen by various people, although I never saw it. I've heard it when I first moved around here. I was living on Vermont Street, which was back in 1923, 24. And uh, as a child then going to school, uh, people would, uh, especially around Halloween, would say, that the veil woman's out. And he was afraid to go up in the cemetery because it said she's up there behind some tombstone, they'd say, but I... I was around with some of them looking, but I never saw any any place.
the legend of the fair lady in Williamsport has been around since I was a child. Uh, my father talked about her. My brothers talked about her. Uh, the old people in Williamsport talked about her. Some joked. And some was very serious about her. Um, my experience with her, I, it was very serious because um, she was very uh, weird looking. She was um, small frame and she had um, all dressed in black. She wore a veil. Um, I'm not sure about a hat. I don't know what the veil was attached to. But, um, her, f you could see a face, but her features weren't plain through the veil. I imagine that's why she wore the veil. She didn't want you to see who she was. But as I think about it, I relive it, and my heart's pounding now because she was really, she really was scary. Uh, my first fair lady, was, I was coming home from the movies in Williamsport, going home to uh, Tannery Row, which is now known as Fenton Avenue, when I saw the shadow behind uh, the big tree there. And as I started by, it moved and came out. And I went to the middle of the road, and she came toward me. So I turned and ran. Up here at the corner of church in Connery Jig, one night, somebody had supposed to have had something down over their head and grabbed these two girls and uh, they ran and one fell and skinned her knee off and they ran over there on the, I think on Ed Shank's porch. And, uh, but I don't remember them saying who it was. He never saw who it was. They were too scared, I guess. Uh, when I asked my father why uh, a person or whatever uh, would try to scare somebody like that, a child, he said that he thought maybe it was uh, a woman or whatever trying to protect the children, to, uh, to keep them home, not go out after dark. Uh, and since then, I think, as I got older and thought back, um, I agree, because really, uh, she never uh, tried to harm me in any way. Just, she just was there. And I think maybe he was right. And I know that people in Williamsport think that uh, it was a joke, and it was a man dressed like um, a woman, and maybe they're right too. But the person I saw was a woman, definitely a woman. The Jonathan Hager House is one of the area's oldest landmarks, and it sits here in Hagerstown City Park. But in the 1700s, this part of Hagerstown looked much different than we see it now. 
Well, Jonathan Hager bought a 200-acre tract from a man named Daniel Delaney in June of 1739, and we know this because of land records. Daniel Delaney eventually would be the founder of Frederick, Maryland, and he had acquired some 10,000 acres here in the Carmel Valley around 1712. This house is built over two springs. Perhaps there was someone here already using the spring water as their source, but as far as this massive stone dwelling goes, no, I'm sure this is the first major structure at this site. Jonathan Hager wasn't the first settler in this area. Proof of about a hundred others before Hager has been found in land deed records. In fact, there were enough settlers in the area to support a grist mill, which was built in 1738, just a mile from Jonathan Hager's home. Soon after purchasing the land, Hager fell in love. Jonathan Hager would eventually marry a neighbor by the name of Elizabeth Kirshner in the year 1740, and that's the year after he built the house. So it's always been believed that Hager gave her this house as a sort of a wedding present. Now, the Kirshner family had already arrived in America in 1731, so they were already established here. I don't believe we know exactly when they came to this particular part of what is now Washington County, Maryland. Uh, I think you'd have to believe that Hager was probably already out here surveying land, determining what land to buy, and run into the people who were already living out here. And some point, certainly prior to uh, the building of the house, he'd probably already met the young Elizabeth Kirshner. Hager lived in the house until 1745, when he sold it to a man named Jacob Rohr. Jacob and his family lived here until 1758, when his son, also named Jacob, inherited the land and the house. The land and the house changed ownership many times over the years, but has looked virtually the same throughout. The Hager house was originally built as a one and a half story house, probably by Hager himself. The full second floor and the attic were all added at a later point in time. It has been argued whether Hager put the addition on or whether another owner, probably one of the Roars, put the addition on, the elevation that is. We'll probably never factually know when this occurred. I personally don't believe that Hager had a full two and a half story house, but did have the one and a half stories. We do believe that the elevation to the house was done sometime prior to 1800. My own opinion is that the second Jacob Roar put the elevation on uh, because he starts having quite a number of children in the 1770s, and I think he just needed the additional space. Uh, other than that, that's the only really structural change to this house. This house has retained its integrity. The walls are all in the same place. Uh, the only thing that people have done over the years is what I will call cosmetic changes, where they had to put on the new roof, and new windows, and new trim, new floorboards, those kinds of things. Today, the house stands as a memorial to Jonathan Hager and the German heritage he brought to Hagerstown. It holds many memories, not only from Jonathan and Elizabeth Hager's life, but also many other families throughout its 200-year history serving as a residence. Michael Hammond is, um, he was one of the owners of the house. He had many children that died here. And a lot of various people that walk through the parks uh, have spotted him on the porch sitting on the bench in his black uh, top hat and black coat, looking some mourning over the loss of his uh, children. Is it possible that these memories are so clear and so vivid that they've remained in the house over the centuries. As a historian, I like to think that I'm trained to look at things objectively and with a little bit of skepticism. And that being said, there are some things that have happened in this particular house that really have no explanation. And although you look for answers, many ways you can't find them. What has happened to me over the years are, are, are little things, but it certainly makes you wonder. Uh, pieces in this house have been known to move. Bulls move on table. Uh, We'll be giving a tour early in the morning, give the second tour a little bit later that morning, and the bull is now in a different place. There is a baby's rocking chair in the master bedroom that has been known to spin around, in fact, during the day. It'll be in different angles. The Jonathan Hager House is open from April until December for tours to the public, but most of the tours come during the summer months. It was during one of these summers the two tour guides experienced a rocking chair that just wouldn't stay still. We had two uh, young tour guides this summer, uh, uh, that, that particular summer, and I think this was the summer of 1997, and the one girl came in, gave her normal tour. This is the master bedroom. It's the only room with a fireplace. The second girl came in right after that tour. She had some other people, so uh, we had back-to-back -back tours on that particular day. And when she got to the master bedroom, she noticed that this baby's rocking chair was now facing 180 degrees the other direction. A girl, Jessica, and I were working here, and she gave a tour, and she said that the chair was moved around facing the opposite direction of the fireplace. When she was done with her tour, she came down and said to the other girl, did you move the rocking chair in the master bedroom? 
And she said, no. She goes, well, it was turned completely around the other way. Well, about the time they finished that conversation, still another tour came for the day, and the first girl had to present that tour. So she's going through the house, and she goes upstairs to the master bedroom, and now this rocking chair was back at the angle in the first place. This is the master bedroom. It's the only room in the fireplace. So this is a chair that, for some reason, has spun completely around during the day. You might look at the story and say, well, perhaps when they weren't looking, a, a tourist moved the chair. And that could be true. And maybe that's the explanation for some of the things that move. But the girls are, and anyone who works here, are trained to make sure that tourists do not touch any of the pieces. And they are supposed to stay with them completely through the tour. So I don't think that a tourist touched that chair that particular day. When we give tours, uh, you are locked in the house with the tour guide. The tour guide will lock the front door so that there are only the people on the tour and the guide themselves are in the house. There is nobody else in the house. Nobody else has the keys except the tour guide. When there are no tours in the house, the door is locked. The keys are kept in the office. So there's absolutely no way that anybody can enter the house and, and move some things without us knowing it. Who or what could be moving the items around the Hager house? Could it be malevolent spirits or just prankster tourists? We also have a corncob doll on this particular rocking chair, and it has moved from side to side during the chair during the day. It used to sit in the rocker, which was in the girls' room, and then we moved the rocker into the master bedroom. And ever, when we moved it, the corncob doll would move from room. It would move up on the chest in the girls' room. It would be on the girls' room in the bed. It would just move all over the upstairs without us touching it. There's a hatchel. It's a piece of equipment that you use to clean out uh, dirt and seeds from uh, flax, which you use to make linen. And about... Two years ago it started, there would, the flax would be in the hatchel and we'd move it out. And every time we'd go in, it'd be back in the hatchel. So we think maybe there's like a spinster ghost or something and it keeps putting it back in the hatchel. It's not just mysteriously moving objects that go on at the Hager house. There have been other things that are, are a little bit more interesting uh, and they actually involve voices. On one particular occasion, when I was closing up the Hager house at the end of the day, I went to get the keys and the lock, went to the door, uh, the front door of the house to, to lock the house up for the evening. And John? And it was so real, the first thing I said was, huh? And I looked behind me, and then of course I realized, wait a second, there was no one else in this house. There have been several Johns who have lived here in this Hager house throughout its existence, so maybe that is somebody calling one of those others. I, I don't know. That was very startling. Uh, so I don't know. Sounds do carry in City Park, so maybe it could be a sound that, that came over from a, an adjoining neighborhood. I guess I'll never know. That's not the first time I've heard voices, though. On one particular morning, I came to the Hager house first thing. From behind me, I heard an elderly woman's voice say, Hello? Now I thought, well, it's the first visitor of the day, and I looked around the house, but there was nobody here yet. On, on one particular occasion, I put the key in the front door at the beginning of the day, and I distinctly heard someone run out the steps. And it was six steps. It was bump, 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 and that's when it ended. And my first reaction was there was somebody in the house, but then it occurred to me, well, the alarm system would have picked up anybody in the house. And so, I, of course, wondered what was going on inside the house. And I did search all around. There was nobody in the house. During craft days three years ago, I was giving um, a tour in the upper hallway. <laughs> Cover with brass tail hinges for decoration. And this piece has a secret inside. Here we have a small drawer. We slide it in and fit it back to the side. A lady in green passed by me. I thought it might have been one of the other workers. So when you put the larger drawer back in, what do you see the smaller box? But they disappeared. One place at the Hager House that has had some of the most interesting incidents doesn't involve moving objects or strange sounds at all. The basement must hold many memories for the families living in the house. This evidence might be seen in some of the strange occurrences witnessed in the basement by visitors, employees, and even our video crew. Last year, we were giving the ghost tours. We were all down in the basement, and um, one of the tour tourists commented that there was a smell of cherry pies, like someone was baking, and we all started to smell it. One of the most interesting events occurred while our own production crew was videotaping a program for the Hager House. And while shooting a segment for the basement, the crew noticed audio problems that could not be explained. The audio problems caused the production to be halted for the day, and eventually the audio mixer had to be sent out for repairs. Upon being asked what the problem was with the mixer, the repair facility could offer no explanation. On a much darker note, 
some of the most disturbing occurrences reported in the basement deal with the feelings of death and distress emanating from a certain corner. Um, the corner of the basement, that's, no one likes to go in there. Everyone thinks it's really creepy and someone might have got killed in there. We have psychics that say that someone was murdered in that corner and it's really spooky. <laughs> I, I think the more interesting thing about the house is virtually everybody who has ever been employed here during my, my tenure at the Hager House are pretty much scared to go down in the cellar by themselves. And I don't know why. They just get a creepy feeling and they don't like it down there. The producers of this program walked through the house with a psychic who described the images they got from the basement as those being associated with the death of either an animal or human. The images were described as all having large amounts of blood associated with them. John has said that he's heard someone yelling from the basement in that corner, someone calling his name, um, different noises coming from the basement area. And no one else I work with likes the basement. No one's ever liked it. I've even had one former tour guide say a scream came from the cellar of the house one day. Again, noises carry in City Park. Maybe that noise came from somewhere else. Jonathan Hager built the house over two springs. Both springs are located in the basement of the house where a large stone fireplace sits. It is believed that most of the cooking was done down in the basement year round. Also located in the basement is a large double door that leads outside. This door is large enough to have brought in livestock for butchering. Are the images that our psychic saw associated with butchering livestock for a weekly meal? Or could it be something more sinister? We'll never know. And the spirits in the house just aren't talking. Jonathan Hager died on November the 5th, 1776, from wounds he received while helping to construct the Zion Reformed Church, which sits on top of the hill on North Potomac Street. There are actually two different accounts of how Jonathan Hager died. Both stories agree on what killed him. A huge log fell on him and crushed him. But the location of the accident is what is different. The first says he was actually killed at the church while he was helping with the construction. The other version of the story say that he was killed at a sawmill along the Antietam Creek when a log rolled on him and crushed him. No matter where the accident occurred, Jonathan Hager and his family finally ended up here at Zion Reformed Church. Could it be that his final resting place isn't there, but here at his home in today's city park? I don't think it's the, the Hagers. I think it might be the Hammond family or the Roars, probably the Hammonds. He had a lot of children that died in the house and um, most of the stuff that happens would be things that kids would do, like moving the corn cob doll and stuff like that. Whether or not someone believes in these particular episodes or not, that's up to them personally. I think it's very interesting that virtually in all religions, there's some discussion of afterlife, yet when you, when you bring it up, you see something that looks like it might be evidence, and people seem to go a little bit nuts about it. I don't know if these things actually happen. I think there's various energies that will always stay around. I mean, energy is never, I guess, like matter, created or destroyed. I think things just happen. Uh, I don't look at reasons why they're happening. I think most of the things at the Hager House are what I call passages in time incidents where somebody ran up the steps once upon a time, it just happened again. The energy is, is just always there. I think they're important, again, to, uh, to cut through the story and try to find the truth behind it because, let's say, someone did run up the steps. Maybe we can find out exactly why he ran up the steps. Maybe there was someone upstairs who was in trouble and he ran up to help that person. We don't know. Again, you have to spend a lot of time cutting through everything else, and then maybe, maybe you can make a determination as to exactly what happened. High atop the hill just outside of Fort Ritchie stands the estate known as Tipahato, an Indian word meaning top of the hill. The house and property are currently owned by Dr. Mary Jo Cannon, a specialist in emergency medicine at Washington County Hospital. It's an interesting story. I, I was, I came to hear about the house when I first came to Hagerstown, began work in the emergency room, and started to work with the retarded citizens. Um, the, there's a movement f to put retarded citizens in private homes, and they told me about a home on 491. I went to see a real estate agent and asked if I could see the home on 491. We s never saw another house. We drove out here, and he had to find it. He, he didn't even know of the house at that time. I saw it. 
we got an appointment for that afternoon. It had been on the market for two years. I had the contract that night, and I had the house in one week, which to me is nothing short of a miracle, <laughs> given that, uh, as I say to people, in 1974, I, I was turned down for a central charge card, you know, and to, uh, yes, I'm a medical doctor, and, you know, I had come to the area, but I, I just, I looked at this house, and I said, oh, I have such a sense about this place. I fell in love with it the first time I walked through, and it's, it just seems more than a coincidence that things worked out so beautifully that my contract was accepted and that I had it in one week. Yeah. I have a tremendous sense that this is a very special place. The house was built in 1902 by Catherine Taylor, the only daughter of a wealthy banker from Baltimore. Catherine fell in love with a musician, but her father refused to grant her permission to marry beneath her class. When her father uh, passed away and she came into her inheritance, she was yet a young woman. She came here, built this house, bought the land for as far as you can see from the royal family. And this, she had parties. She raced greyhounds. She had, this, I like this lady. <laughs> she went on safaris to Africa. She um, had parties. And people would come in at the train station in Cascade, which was Blue Ridge Summit at the time, and they'd come by carriage up the hill to the carriage port, which she had built out here. Uh, I had heard all of this before I moved in. I knew that she lived here until she died. I knew she was buried next door in the cemetery next to the stone church, but no one had ever said anything about haunted hauntings. But I had been here for a couple of days, and I was coming down the front stairway with a friend, when the front door opened and closed. And it was, it was an exceptional experience that we, both of us were, you know, we stopped and we looked. There was no wind. There weren't drafts. It was a sun, well, it felt like a summer afternoon. It was late September, but the, the door just opened and closed. And that to me has been a major type of occurrences, uh, in, ter in terms of what happens in the house. But, uh, it was, again, maybe a month after that, that I was watching a TV show with the same friend sitting upstairs, and the knob on the door right across from us opened, and the door opened and closed, and that at a couple of other points in the next couple of hours, the door, each time we just smiled into each other, you know. Um, and, and again, in the first, when I had been here, during the first month, I had a tremendous sense of a presence in the room on this floor that is to your right when you first come in, which I think of as a formal dining room um, type area. And I, I just had a very strong sense of there being a type of presence in there. I thought I saw someone walk into the room, so that's the only time, and it was such a strong impression of someone walking into the room. Just kind of glanced out the door and thought someone was walking into the room. I immediately surmised it was Linda and walked out and started talking to her. But she wasn't in the room, she was upstairs, so... At, at any rate, it wasn't long after I mentioned the door opening and closing, and people say, oh yes, it's haunted. You know, Catherine died, everyone knows it's haunted, you know. And I would hear from other people that they, and I also talked with the family who owned it before, who'd never mentioned anything uh, in reference to hauntings, whose son had had a number of experiences similar to this, and he said, oh, yes, as though, of course. After so many unusual experiences at the house, a pattern of events developed. In reference to whether or not we have the occurrences coming in clusters or at certain times of the year. I have been here now over a year, and I've found myself beginning to watch. Uh, when I recently had the house reappraised, there were a number of things in one day, and there will be long periods of time during which everything is quite is quiet. Uh, I wondered whether we would have more experiences today because we would be talking, but I, I haven't as, as yet uh, had any today. Uh, although that one day I was very much aware because of doors opening and closing and when a friend arrived and I'd been cleaning and getting the house ready for the appraisal and I mentioned that it, this was the room 
where Catherine had died, that there had been so much movement about it. And um, she made a statement to me in reference to Catherine, and the door slammed on the room. And it was one of those times, there's been approximately three times, when, while discussing Catherine, something occurs. You know, uh, an object will move, or as in this case, the door slammed shut because we looked at each other and she said, I don't think Catherine likes that. <laughs> it seems more than a coincidence that most of the occurrences revolve around the month of September. It's the month that I bought the house and I saw it in the same month. I mean, so, and then I had it reappraised in the same month. Maybe we'll find a pattern here. After our discussion with Dr. Cannon, we visited the cemetery in which Catherine was buried. It's a known fact that when Catherine passed away, she was in the front bedroom of the house. And according to the stone marking her grave, she died in the month of September. We asked Dr. Cannon how she came to believe that it was the ghost of Catherine Taylor that was haunting her home. That's my interpretation, although when I began to mention to people that the door opened and closed and, and that things moved or whatever, um, it would it seems that this is common knowledge among people who have been lived here for a long time, that things happen in this house, and that is Catherine. It's interesting, though, that the very first time I was in the house and the door opened and closed, and I felt that, felt that sense of someone, I felt that it was Catherine. And how does it feel to be haunted by the ghost of the previous owner of your house? It's always been comfortable. There's never been anything frightening. Catherine has the spirit of the energy here, and I, I see that as Catherine has always been benevolent. There's, I've always had good feelings about her, uh, as well as everyone else who has had experiences here. The question of belief in ghosts is as old as man's imagination and intelligence. Some feel that believing in the existence of the supernatural indicates an impressionable nature, while others feel it shows a sensitivity and openness to infinite possibilities. Do ghosts really exist? As for the estate of Tipuhato, only Catherine Taylor holds the answer. I have such a sense about this place. In the 1800s, on the site of the building we know today as the Baldwin House, stood the magnificent Washington House Hotel. In late 1859, on a sweltering summer evening, a mysterious tall man checked into the hotel with his two sons and an associate. The four men deliberately and quietly went straight to their rooms on the second floor, speaking to no one. But as history would tell, the names registered in the hotel's ledger weren't the men's real names. We have the ledger book uh, at the Western Maryland room, which has the signature. He signed it uh, Isaac Smith because he didn't want his uh, actual name to be known. But his two sons signed it. They listed themselves as residents of New York, which was false. During that hot summer night, another hotel guest on the second floor became ill. <laughs> Oh, thank you for coming. Well, how long has he been like this? A couple of hours. Let me look at him. I think he has a serious case of consumption. The man screaming awoke the other guests who began to fill into the hallway to investigate the awful noise. One of the people who came out of their rooms was a young woman carrying a baby in her arms. At the same time, the tall man also came from his room to see what the commotion was all about. When the young woman with the child saw the mysterious tall man enter the hallway, she seemed to go mad. No, no, don't hurt me! Don't take my baby! Years later, history would reveal that the young woman wasn't mad at all, but in fact was telling the truth. She had previously been living in a small town in Kansas and was traveling eastward to start a new life with her baby. When she saw the mysterious man in the Washington House Hotel, she immediately recognized him. The man who registered that June evening was none other than the infamous abolitionist John Brown, 
who had raided all the slave-owning households in Kansas, including hers, killing her husband and burning their home. Seeing Brown so far away from her Kansas home was a shock from which the woman had never fully recovered. After the event, John Brown and his sons traveled to the southern part of Washington County, to the Kennedy Farm, which was a staging point for Brown's famous raid on Harper's Ferry just a short time later. It is said today in the Baldwin House, on hot June evenings, if you walk slowly down one of the second floor hallways, you may hear the eerie, distant screaming of a young woman begging for the life of her child. Here, in the presence of sombered souls, lies Michael Zill, a man that grew to palatial importance for the inhabitants of South Mountain. Did you know of his existence? There was a time when he was the most valued man for miles and miles. In fact, they say even the local physicians would consult him from time to time. There's been some documentation of the existence of Wizard Zill. Doug Boss, the local historian, will recount that existence and some of those legends and superstitions that are so much a part of South Mountain in the little town of Boonesboro. The Zittles came from Pennsylvania and moved into this area about 1800. And like a lot of the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch, their religion was somewhat mysterious. And pretty soon, Michael Zittle Jr. became known for his ability to bring about wondrous cures. And people were coming from all around, seeking his help and his advice, hoping to be cured. And many of them were very ple pleased and apparently felt that he could cure them. These cures were brought about from various charms, or you might say hex formulae, that were in an old German book in the possession of Zittel. Mrs. Dahlgren, who wrote about Zittel in 1882 in her book, South Mountain Magic, felt that Wizard Zittel practiced black magic, that he was blasphemous. But actually, Zittel was a faith healer. These little charms were prayers to him. They were benedictions. And actually what he was doing was blessing the wound or blessing the illness. In Zittel's book, there's a charm for almost any problem that might arise. How to stop blood. That's a famous one. How to make a thief bring back stolen goods. Here's a handy one. How to stop bullets. A sure cure for the go-backs. That's the one that Wizard Zittle was most famous for. His ability to cure the go-backs. Today we would call go-backs the rickets. It's the apparent wasting away of a young child. Instead of growing, the child seems to be going in the opposite direction. Hence the name go-backs. The cure for the go-backs was always done with great secrecy. The priestess would lay the child out on the table, studying the child and then slowly spreading his arms out in the form of a cross. Then she would take two pieces of special string. The first piece she would use to measure the child across from the fingertip to the fingertip to see how wide he actually was. Then she would take the second piece of string and she would measure from the tip of his head to the very tip of his toes. Then she would see what the difference was. This was the test to see whether the child really had go-backs, because if he measured more across the arm span than he did for the full height, that was a sure sign he had the go-backs. Then she would proceed with the cure. 
she would take the jug of special oil. And she would put it on her hands. And then taking the two thumbs, she would massage the body in a special way down the breastbone, all the while saying, Abaman depart, Abaman depart, Abaman depart. Then she would take those two pieces of string and the first piece she would wind around the hinge of the house hall doorway and the second string around the lower hinge of the doorway. And then as a normal opening and closing of the door, within a few days, those strings would be worn the whole way through. And when they were worn through, then the child was cured. That's if the charm really worked. Ah, South Mountain. It's a wonderful place to be. At least these days, it's not as filled with superstitions and legends. Or is it? In Wizard Michael Ziddle's day, he roused the uncertainty in the minds of those who made South Mountain their home. And down there, in Ziddle's town, is not only the home of Wizard Michael Ziddle, but it's also the byway from which travelers made their way over South Mountain and down the old forgotten logging road. And many legends have waxed in this little community and remain to be a part of its heritage. The next time you visit downtown Hagerstown, take notice of some of the older buildings around you. What kind of stories do they have to tell? What events took place inside these buildings long ago? Hagerstown began as a frontier town laid out in September 1762 by Jonathan Hager on a tract of land he called New Work. Hager laid out 520 lots of one half acre each among seven streets. These streets today are known as Walnut, Jonathan, Potomac, Church, Franklin, Washington, and Antietam. Despite the date of 1762 as the official founding date, there is much disagreement over when the city was actually founded. Some historians believe it wasn't founded until 1765 when the first parcels of land were sold. Hager, more than anything else in his life, uh, would be a land speculator. From the time he sells this house in 1745, he continues to buy land at a low price and sell off tracts and chunks of it at a profit. Uh, it's argued exactly when Hagerstown is laid out, and the best evidence is either 1762, which is the accepted date, or 1765. Whatever the year he decided to lay out the town, he certainly profited because he laid out 520 lots. Each lot consisted of about a half an acre each, so he was selling each individual lot. And that's where Hager would have made an awful lot of his money. And it does appear that the uh, town itself, Hagerstown, which originally was called Elizabethtown, after his wife Elizabeth, was basically put together as a center for trade use. Uh, it looks like he wanted to encourage traders to come into this area and put their warehouses in his brand new town. However, the name Elizabethtown never caught on with the townspeople. They instead adopted the name Hager's Town. Because the townspeople were using both names and the confusion it was causing, the city council voted to officially change the name to Hagerstown on December 5, 1814. Nestled within the farmland that surrounded it, Hagerstown led a quiet life throughout its early history. However, during the Civil War, Hagerstown saw excitement several times as both Union and Confederate armies occupied the town. Several years later, in the summer of 1863, the streets of Hagerstown erupted with the sounds of the Civil War. It was during that summer that one of the largest and deadliest battles of the Civil War took place just north of the Mason-Dixon line. On July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, the farm fields around Gettysburg, Pennsylvania were witness to the horrors of the Civil War. The battle ended in the failed charge, now known as Pickett's Charge, and the terrible loss of thousands of men. And following Pickett's failed charge on the third day, Robert E. Lee decided to pull his army from the battlefield and uh, retreat back to the safe ground of Virginia. His route that he selected would have brought him out of Gettysburg to Fairfield, roughly down through Waynesboro and uh, Greencastle, through Hagerstown to Williamsport, and then crossing the Potomac at Williamsport back to Virginia. In his withdrawal, 
General Lee sent the wounded first in a 17-mile wagon train with Jeb Stuart's cavalry in support. However, when Stuart and the wounded arrived in Williamsport, they found the Potomac River overflowing from the summer storms that had followed the battle. Lee's plans had to change. The cavalry under Stuart was directed to protect the east of the Confederate Army. They came down through Smithsburg, Hagerstown. Well, prior to their arrival, the Federals arrived here in Washington County at Boonesboro. After an engagement in Smithsburg on July the 5th, Confederate General Jeb Stuart decided to send two regiments of his cavalry into Hagerstown on Monday, July the 6th. But Stuart's men soon discovered the Federal Army had sent their own men into the city of Hagerstown. These mounted Union regiments were under the command of Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick. So at noon on Monday the 6th, the uh, fighting began in the streets of Hagerstown. Kilpatrick's men coming in. Kilpatrick uh, had with him uh, two divisions. One of those was uh, Custer's, Michigan's. He also had a West Virginia uh, division with him, and most of these were engaged in downtown Hagerstown. Roughly, the fighting which existed between around noon and dark in Hagerstown extended between what is roughly now the library on South Potomac Street up to Zion Reformed Church on North Potomac Street and in the side streets around there. And there was a lot of fighting in and around the square. And the Federals pushed the Confederates up the hill towards Zion. The Confederates took positions behind the tombstones of the stone wall at Zion Reformed Church. The fighting moved up and down Potomac Street several times that afternoon. Then as the afternoon wore on, First West Virginia came into the square along with the 18th Pennsylvania and they formed for one big charge up the hill. Now what they didn't know was the first foot soldiers from Gettysburg had arrived in town. See, the cavalry got there a number of hours. They could ride where these other guys had to walk. Got here and there was a, a regiment that formed up around Zion before one church. And when the cavalry charged up the hill, the Confederates greeted them with one massive volley. They just decimated the group, drove them back down to the square. The evening wore on. At about dusk, uh, Kilpatrick decided to pull out of Hagerstown because he had suffered a lot of losses. And the Confederates maintained control of Hagerstown. Lee and his forces were finally able to withdraw to the Virginia side of the Potomac River on the evening of the 12th and the morning of the 13th. But it wasn't until Lee had fought several other skirmishes besides Hagerstown. The engagement at Hagerstown was the only fighting in the county that recorded any civilian casualties. At the outbreak of the fighting downtown, a young artist named John Stemple decided he would venture to the square to sketch the fighting. He thought that if he'd be able to capture the images of the battle, he might be able to earn a bit of extra money by selling his artwork to a major newspaper. The studios were about one block west of the square, about where the banks are right now. He went down, climbed up on the roof of a building that was occupied by Marshall and Cranwell. It was a hardware store. The Marshall and Cranwell hardware store occupied the northeast corner of Public Square, the current location of the clock tower. Stemple climbed up to the roof of Marshall and Cranwell's to capture the battle scene below in the square. Shortly after he had set up his tripod and easel, a stray bullet punctured his skull. Two men and a woman who were taking refuge down in the hardware store immediately ran up to care for the artist who was bleeding profusely. They carried him to the floor below where a doctor was called for. I don't think he's going to make it. John, you're getting help. Don't worry, we'll take care of you. But because all the doctors were already preoccupied with soldiers from the battle, they had no choice but to take him across the square to the home of a woman who practiced medicine. Easy, easy. Stemple was carried to the home and cared for by the woman. But despite all of her efforts, she could do nothing for the doomed artist. Will he be okay? 
I don't think so. But despite the woman's efforts, she could not stop the bleeding. Stemple finally died in less than an hour after the bullet pierced his head. John Stemple's body rests in Rose Hill Cemetery on South Potomac Street. His presence can often be felt late at night where the store once stood and the artist met his end. Some even say they've heard an agonizing scream of pain. Some even say that Stemple can be seen on the anniversary of the battle in one of the windows of the clock tower, roughly where the rooftop of Marshall and Cramwell's store once reached. It could be said that one of the great traditions in England is the presence of ghosts. Haunted castles, haunted cathedrals, haunted theaters. It seems as if ghostly legends add an appealing air of mystery and magic to the surroundings. That's why it's really no surprise to find that such legends have carried over to the United States. In fact, Hagerstown's own historic Maryland theater is in keeping with such traditions. Former executive director of the theater, Mike Harsh, will tell us about the legend of the ghosts of the Maryland theater. One of the interesting things that I learned about the Maryland Theater when I started working here in late 1979 was that there were a number of stories about a ghost in the Maryland Theater. Uh, at various times, I would hear stories from people who either had worked here or who currently work here about a presence in the theater. Uh, perhaps they heard whistling when no one was there or they heard something rolling under the seats or they felt a presence behind them or a cold draft and when they turned around there was no one there. Um, after I was here for a while, I myself began to not only hear some of the stories, but I also occasionally began to think that I heard uh, maybe there was a presence in the theater. After looking into it a bit more, I began to like to think about the spirit of the Maryland Theater or the ghost of the Maryland Theater as being a very protective one, a benevolent one, one that perhaps may have even saved the theater from destruction during the very big fire that destroyed the entire front of this building, came right to the back of the theater where we're standing now, and then the fire stopped. And the theater itself, all its beauty, its history was saved for all the rest of us for generations to come. If there is a spirit, it's probably one that is protective. Uh, I talked to this, talked about this to a number of people, and one of the sons of one of the former managers of the Maryland Theater said that perhaps it was, in fact, his father, who was a manager here for many, many years, uh, was forced into an early retirement and never really wanted to leave the place. And maybe this haunting was a way of him coming back and taking care of the theater. George N. Payette managed the Maryland Theater through three decades, ranging from the 1930s until his retirement in the early 1960s. With determination and commitment, Mr. Payette saw the theater through its prosperous years as well as its periods of decline. We spoke with his daughter, Pat Grove. Uh, my father, uh, his name was George N. Payette, and he was the manager of the Maryland Theater from 1935 until 1962. Uh, my brother and sister and I really grew up at the Maryland Theater. We went to the movies many times, and we always had a special place to sit, uh, about fifth or sixth row back on the right-hand side. And when it was time for us to leave, my father always stood in the back on the right-hand side, and he coughed. <clears throat> and we knew then it was time to get up and leave so we could get a ride home. Uh, if there is a ghost at the Maryland Theater, it possibly could be my father because he loved the theater so much. And he, he would be a good ghost, though, because he want, he'd like to uh, see that it's being taken care of. In addition, there are a few other theories as to the identity. Could have been a performer. Could have been a jilted lover of a performer. I'm sure that in the four years I was here, there were several people who were jilted by people backstage. Could have been a, a body that was found in the wreckage of the front part of the lobby after the fire in 1973. There are a lot of theories and there's a lot of conjecture. And I think that it's a fascinating part of the history of any theater, including one as, as beautiful and full of history as this one. 
When I came to the Maryland Theater shortly after I started working here, stories about the ghosts began to surface. They were told frequently, although they are very minimal, as you know by what my Karsh has told you. There are only a few ghost stories, and pretty much they all take the same vein. There are people whistling, uh, cans rolling down the aisles people hearing people walking on the steps. Those are the kind of stories that we heard. I remember in particular one event that was conveyed to me by a gentleman, um, a, a young man who worked here at the Maryland Theater. He was a volunteer. As he was cleaning the theater one day, he decided that he was going to explore the uh, little nooks and crannies that this building has quite a few of. And he started to climb up the ladder into the superstructure. And as he was making his way up the ladder, he conveyed that he had felt someone pull on his leg. He immediately descended the ladder, made his way to the lobby, and conveyed his story to us who, was, who were in the lobby in a rather frightened voice. I like the whistling stories, too. Uh, several times, different people and myself, I had heard late at night, uh, which was really early in the morning after a show, say a show would be over at 11 o'clock, by the time loadout was finished, it might be 2 a.m., mm -hmm. by the time the crew was finished cleaning up, having their dinner, 3, 4 a.m., lock up the theater and hear very ethereal, melodic whistling throughout the halls of the Maryland Theater. I had a little fun with that once in a while, too. Occasionally, when we'd have a employee working in here late at night, I used to like to sneak out of my office, which is about two stories above us, and up on top of the balcony and whistle myself and see what kind of reaction I got. Uh, usually, the reaction was out the door of the theater. Another story that I used to like to tell people was a story of one of our employees who did maintenance work and cleaning work. Um, we used to like to tell the story of the ghost a lot. And after telling it to people often enough, then they began to have their own ghost stories. This particular employee, uh, early one morning when the box office manager came to work, she found him sitting out in the plaza on a brilliant sunlit day. And uh, she thought he looked rather pale. And she said, what's the matter? And he said, well, I went in to clean the theater. And as I was getting ready to come into the auditorium part of the theater, I heard somebody coming down the steps. And he stopped and he kept hearing the footsteps getting closer and closer and closer. And he turned and looked up the stairs, and of course no one was there. There's a great tradition in theater of ghosts. Probably the most famous one would be the Phantom of the Opera, which of course was a myth about a haunting, which in fact turned out to be an actor or performer who had been... Uh, damaged physically in one way. Maybe that's why I always got a kick out of uh, perpetuating the myth and sometimes adding to it myself. But we don't really know. And we do know that there have been many, many times when this theater was on the brink of disaster. And if it wouldn't have been, for instance, for the citizens to save the Maryland Theater uh, back in the late 70s, and if it would not have been for the kindness and generosity of the people in the community during the 80s, uh, the theater would have been badly damaged by fire, by neglect, by misuse, by rain, when the roof leaked very badly. I think there is a benevolent spirit here. And whether that spirit is a physical presence of somebody particular that had died in the past, or whether it's the collective spirits of all of us, 
who have loved and enjoyed the Maryland Theater over the years since it first opened in 1915. Regardless, that's a very real spirit and a very real presence, and it's fun to feel that here and fun to talk about. When you're here at the Maryland Theater and you hear the stories of the ghost being talked about uh, by the volunteers, being conveyed from the volunteers to the patrons, uh, after a while you begin to wonder if, if maybe you won't be lucky enough to experience one of these. Uh, one evening I was working here very late, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and I was coming out of the office and I went past the balcony steps, and for a moment I thought I heard someone in the balcony whistling. I had a moment of fright, but I also decided that if it was a ghost, he was a benevolent ghost. He was here to watch over the Maryland Theater, and he was watching over me. Another story tells not of a human spirit, but of a faithful horse. This legend takes place on the site of what is now the Potomac Street parking deck. But in 1863, the Franklin Hotel stood in its place. Not too long after the Battle of Hagerstown, the Federal Army was able to dislodge the Confederates from the streets of the town. On July the 12th, Union General George Armstrong Custer's Michigan regiments cleared the town and returned it to Federal control. Custer's men took several casualties in the fight, and those who were wounded were left to recover as the Federal Army marched back toward Washington. One of Custer's men who was wounded in the battle was Captain Pennyback. He had received several deep saber wounds to his body, keeping him from leaving with the rest of the Union Army. Pennybacker's horse was an old, faithful stallion named Monarch that was stabled in the rear of the hotel and cared for by one of the grateful citizens of Hagerstown. Every day, Captain Pennybacker would call for his horse and have him brought to the front of the hotel where he could see and talk to his faithful companion. Thank you, sir. Pennybacker eventually died from his wounds, and the horse was given to the young man who had cared for it. Over the following years, Monarch would break away from his new master's stable and return to the hotel, awaiting the kind words of his master, words that never came. It's been reported on dark nights when no moon is visible, you can hear Pennybacker's faithful horse trotting to the front of the building. Sometimes it's believed that you can even hear the captain's lonely calls in a desperate effort to make contact with his valiant steed. The city of Hagerstown has had a long, rich history. Even today, you can see some of the lasting results of the fighting in downtown. On the building that houses Psalms Jewelers, you can still see some of the bullet marks on the second and third floors. The stories we have visited are just a few of the stops along the Ghosts of Hagerstown walking tour. You can find out more about some of the other buildings and stories every October when the city of Hagerstown hosts the walking tours. Over the decades, Hagerstown has changed. Residents and visitors have come and gone. Buildings have done the same. But one thing that has remained is the history and legends that belong to the city of Hagerstown. The battle at Crampton's Gap was meant to be the main focus of McClellan's advance on the 14th of September. He had given very positive and very uh, uh, precise orders to General Franklin, commanding the 6th Union Army Corps, to advance from his position in Jefferson, or beyond Jefferson, to take possession of Crampton's Gap, and once through the Gap, to vigorously uh, go through Pleasant Valley and rescue that Harper's Ferry garrison of 12,000 or more federal soldiers. Uh, this was to be the end run. And uh, almost from the beginning, Franklin does not move near as vigorously as McClellan had uh, encouraged or anticipated him to do. When the uh, Federal Sixth Corps arrived in Burkittsville, they got there about noon and were met by artillery fire on the uh, top of the mountain. Uh, they, they dropped back, uh, ate lunch, and took about four hours to develop an actual scheme of attack. 
when the attack came, it came again around about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. As the Union Sixth Corps approached Burkittsville, uh, the Confederate guns will begin to fire at long range, uh, seeing this approach coming and realizing that they can slow down and attack. And uh, Franklin will order up some of his artillery to deploy and fire back. And so there is a, a substantial artillery barrage that is going to accompany this infantry assault. The uh, initial artillery position early in the morning was further down around the turn. This was part of uh, Chew's battery. And then the Portsmouth Light artillery also joined them there on that particular area. Uh, as the fighting started and it looked like the Confederate line was going to be overwhelmed, Chew and the other guns pulled out of the area. Uh, Again, it wasn't until Cobb arrived with his regiment that the troop light artillery who was attached to them came into the gap itself. Basically, they had one gun pointing down each road uh, as the Federals popped up over the hill. And they were only able to get off about five rounds, but even at that, they did so very well. And that fact wasn't missed by one of the Federal officers who commended them for their bravery. Once they see that a Union attack is forming, they will send word to McClaws that they are about to be attacked and asking for reinforcements. McClaws will respond by sending a brigade of Georgians commanded by a general by the name of uh, Cobb to Crampton's Gap to reinforce the uh, pitifully small defenders, the uh, Virginia regiments under Parham and, and Munford's uh, two regiments of, of Confederate cavalry. Uh, but Cobb's Georgians will arrive practically simultaneously with the Union assault. Federal Sixth Corps, of course, at that time had about 12,000 men in. Uh, unbeknownst to them, though, behind a stone wall along what's called Mountain Church Road today was only about 1,000 Confederate soldiers. When the Union soldiers close in on the Confederates along the stone wall at Mountain Church Road, the order of charge is given. As this Federal advance begins, as the charge is made and the Virginians at the wall begin to give way, uh, there will be an attempt to get the artillery pieces out of there that they will bring up their horse teams, attach their cannons to the limbers, which the horses pull, and, of course, retreat back over the hill. But they will try to make a fighting retreat of it, pausing a couple of times to fire. Uh, some of Cobb's uh, artillery guns will be captured. He had brought up a battery with him, and uh, that uh, battery will lose two guns in this fight. So once the Federals' push uh, started in earnest, the, the, the story was foretold. A uh, sheer weight of numbers again drove the Confederates from behind the stone wall, pushed them up through the gap. And so the Federals will be driving up uh, the two roads that intersect at the top of Crampton's Gap at where the correspondence arch is now, and in between the two, and driving back the Confederate defenders as they uh, uh, do so. And of course, it is simply a matter of numbers, and uh, uh, the Confederates will be forced to yield with severe losses. Confederates tried one last stand in the pass itself, again along another stone wall. Two guns of the troop light artillery were brought up and fired canister right into the faces of the Federal soldiers as they were popping up over the ridge. Uh, this staggered the Federals for a moment, but again, sheer weight of numbers told the tale, and they were quickly overwhelmed and were forced to draw off the top of the mountain down into the uh, valley beyond. Franklin's troops, too exhausted to pursue, come up the road and spend the night in the gap and along these mountain roads. It is the Confederate withdrawal up and into Crampton's Gap that serves as the basis for our first South Mountain legend. The legend of Spook Hill tells the story of the Confederate artillerymen who valiantly tried to save their guns during the Union charge up the mountainside. As the Union soldiers charged towards them, the Confederate soldiers manning the guns tried desperately to push their cannons up the side of the mountain. But as the Confederates pushed the guns upward, they were either shot or had to abandon the guns to save their own lives. This caused the cannons to roll back down the hill, killing the other Confederate soldiers who were also fleeing for their lives below. It is believed by local residents that these poor Confederate souls never left the battlefield that day. Today, the area is quiet. The sounds of cannons aren't even a memory anymore. The entire area shows virtually no signs of the Battle of South Mountain, except for an occasional sign along the road. But there is one spot along the Gapland Road that may still hold the memories of the actions that took place that afternoon. It is said that if you stop your car at a certain spot along Gapland Road next to the battlefield, place it in neutral, you'll begin to drift uphill. Uphill. 
People speculate that it's those Confederate soldiers that are pushing vehicles back up the mountain. They are forever charged with the task of pushing the cannons back up the mountain to Crampton's Gap and away from the advancing Federals. Some say the legend isn't true, that the portion of Gaplin Road is just an optical illusion. They claim that the road in fact slopes downwards, not upwards. It's just a simple trick of optics. But some tell an entirely different legend altogether. The legend that I know of surrounding Burkittsville uh, was that uh, after the battle, a wagon load of wounded, evidently without horse teams attached, was left on a piece of the road which looked evidently to be level or slightly tilted in one direction, but in fact it was an optical illusion sort of thing. We're actually tilted in the other, and so when they unhitched the teams and just left the wagon sitting, it moved in a direction that appeared to many people to be rolling uphill, and that this was a phenomena that uh, many people took as some sort of uh, uh, sign. And so the legend was that uh, in modern times people would drive their automobiles to this spot and take them out of gear and, and release emergency brake, and the car would likewise appear to roll uphill. And People began to make some sort of uh, conclusion that this had something to do with the spiritual world and not uh, physics. The, uh, the legend, as I heard it, was that uh, prior to the Battle of South Mountain, or just as the battle was beginning, a uh, Confederate artillery group was trying to push one of their artillery pieces up the road towards the mountain to get it up on top ready for, uh, for action. When a Federal artillery shell landed on the crew, killing them all instantly. Uh, the legend then is that to, even to today, that same group of men are trying to push that cannon to the top of the mountain, which is why you can take your car down there, put it in neutral, and it starts to roll backwards up the mountain. Is it simple physics? Does the road actually slope downhill? Maybe. Then again, yet maybe something else entirely different is happening along that stretch of Gaplin Road. In our last Legends program, we brought you the story of an old farmer who lived here at Fox's Gap by the name of Daniel Wise. As the legend goes, Old Man Wise was contracted by the Union Army to help bury the dead on his land after the Battle of South Mountain. The fighting at Fox's Gap was some of the fiercest of all the fighting that September day, and it lasted the longest. The combat at Fox's Gap started around 9 in the morning and lasted until well after dark. The combat started uh, between 3,000 Ohio troops under the command of General Jacob D. Cox and 1,000 North Carolinians under the command of Brigadier General Samuel Garland. Around about 10.30 in the morning, uh, Samuel Garland, Confederate uh, general, was uh, mortally wounded on the field. At that point, of course, Confederate resistance started to dissolve and the Federals were able to push the Confederates through the gap and actually controlled the gap by around noon. They held their ground for almost two hours. Uh, and it was uh, one of the few instances in the war where there was actually hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it, it got that fierce. Usually in the Civil War, when the two armies would come together, the, the sheer terror of, of the firepower, you know, the, the charges would just peter out before there was physical contact. But there was about a 15 to 20 minute period around mid-morning when it actually got to club muskets and, and bayonet wounds. It was during the fierce morning fighting that Confederate General Samuel Garland was mortally wounded and taken to the old South Mountain Inn, or as it was known then, the Mountain House. Eventually, the North Carolinians, for the most part, were driven down the west face of the mountain, and uh, Cox's Ohioans ha had actually won the crest. But now the, the Union Army was suffering under the misconception that the Confederates were a much larger force and there was a Johnny behind every tree. These tactics were enough to stall the Union Army to wait until reinforcements arrived to renew the fighting. What these rebels did, they called bushwhacking. They would hide behind a fence, jump up and shoot, duck down, run to another place, jump up and shoot. And they were all over Fox's Gap and it gave General Cox the impression that there was a much larger force. And so he decided that discretion was the better part of valor, and he would wait for reinforcements. He pulled back. Anderson's men uh, continued their bushwhacking, and, and sort of a lull sets in around midday. Now, as the day progresses, more Union troops start showing up from the direction of Frederick. 
And we're talking about the Union 9th Corps under the overall command of General Ambrose Burnside. The Corps commander is General Jesse Lee Reno. The troops of the 9th Corps start showing up and start supporting Cox's position, getting ready for a general advance around 4 or 5 in the afternoon. On the Confederate side, uh, Longstreet's troops start arriving from Hagerstown. There's a bit of an irony with the Battle of South Mountain. Uh, many of the Union soldiers started their march some 12 miles to the east in Frederick, while many of the Confederates started their march that morning some 11 miles to the west from Hagerstown, and they both meet on the mountain. The area around Wise's cabin was hotly contested. Uh, this part of the battlefield was fought over the entire day, and uh, square foot for square foot, the fighting was just as intense here as you find on any other Civil War battlefield. Antietam, Gettysburg, doesn't matter. Soldiers long after the war talked about how hot and intense the fighting was in this part of the field. Uh, the Wise's cabin became a feature. Uh, it was well defined, it was easy to see, so a lot of the troops referred to it in their after action reports and in their diaries and things like that. So the, uh, the, the fighting swirled around Wise's cabin throughout the entire day. As the Confederates tried to launch their counterattack, they used what was called the Sharpsburg Road at that time as a line to form up in. They started to move across Wise's south field uh, towards the Federals that were lined up along a stone line, a stone wall against the, uh, the south end of that field. Unbeknownst to them, of course, this was the remainder of the Ninth Corps that had managed to get, it up, get itself up on top of the mountain before they launched their attack. In the rush to get their men on the field, some Confederate troops wound up getting lost on the west face of the mountain. These lost troops were supposed to have been part of a larger contingent of Confederate troops that were supposed to be a grand movement that was to sweep the Federals from the mountain. As a result, only one regiment of troops from the Plan 3 entered the field of battle and ended up taking heavy casualties. One new regiment, the 17th Michigan, about 900 green troops fresh out uh, of Michigan, uh, less than two weeks, managed to get in a field behind Drayton's troops, come up behind them, and fire down into what is now the Reno Monument Road. Drayton's men take horrific casualties. One regiment uh, went in with 250 men and came out with 120, more than 50% casualties. And some of the bodies in the well, uh, in Wise's well at South Mountain, probably were Drayton's men. And you hear the exact same comments about that part of the road as you hear about Bloody Lane, men's bodies stacked like cordwood. Uh, you could walk from one end of the road to the other without once touching the ground because of the large number of bodies that were stacked in there. Uh, because of that, of course, the 50 51st Georgia had to get out of the, the way they could. They had to run the gauntlet down the road and off the uh, west side of the mountain, uh, ending the fighting in that part of the field. So what exactly is the legend of Wise as Well? This is the monument that marks the spot where General Reno was killed during the Battle of South Mountain. The Battle of South Mountain was a bloody battle. Folks that had witnessed that said that it seemed like the side of the mountain ran red with blood. There were several generals killed during that battle. But after the battle was over, as darkness fell, the Confederates retreated under cover of darkness and marched over to Sharpsburg. Now the next morning when the sun came up and the Union generals looked over the battlefield, the Confederates were gone. They had retreated during the night. All they saw were the dead and dying just strewn all over the battlefield. Now as quickly as possible, they took care of the wounded, but they didn't have time to bury the dead. But they realized if they left those bodies out there in the hot September sun, there might be a catastrophe. There might be an epidemic. So they decided that they would offer a dollar a body to all the local farmers to bury those dead Confederates. Now, right here in this spot is Fox's Gap. This is where some of the worst fighting took place of the entire day. And just a stone's throw from here is the spot where old man Wise had his log cabin. Now, that cabin was in horrible shape before the battle. But the morning after the battle, folks could not really believe that, that the cabin was still standing. It was so full of holes from cannons and shot and shell. Now that morning, as he strolled out and looked in his yard, 
He saw bodies everywhere. And he had heard about that offer of a dollar a body. He looked out there and he thought, I'm going to make myself a heap of money. So old man Wise started out over the battlefield and started to drag those dead bodies one by one back to his house. And he had all these bodies laying there in his front yard. And he thought, boy, that's sure going to be an awful lot of digging to dig graves for all those dead rebels. And then he had an idea. Over there he had a well. And that well wasn't much good. It was a dry well. And he thought to himself, I'm going to take those dead bodies and I'm going to bury them all right. And I'm going to bury them in my old well. And that's what he did. He took 58 dead rebel soldiers and he shoved and he stuck and he forced all of those in that dry well. And then when he was finished, he threw in a lot of soil and he covered them up. Now, all the people around had heard about this, and they were up in arms. They said those dead rebels, they were, they were our enemies, but that's sacrilege. You don't stuff them in a well. That's not the proper burial. But old man Wise, he was tickled with himself. He thought, well, I'm going to go down to Boonesboro, and I'm going to buy myself a new tobacco pipe and some tobacco. And that's what he did. He walked down to Boonesboro, got himself some supplies, and about two weeks later, in the evening, he was sitting on his front stoop on an old cracker box. And he was puffing away on that pipe, just enjoying himself, thinking, boy, I made myself a heap of money. And all of a sudden, he saw a movement down the road. Turn me over, Mr. Wise. Who are you? I'm most uncomfortable lying on my face. Turn me over. Please turn me over. Please turn me over. Turn me over. Turn me over. And he climbed in that well with his spade, and he started to dig. And he was digging as fast as he could. Finally, the 13th soldier, that was the one. Well, then he started to, to dig, and sure enough, the soldier was resting on his head. No wonder he was uncomfortable. He very carefully got that soldier out, and he reburied him. So he worked through the night. Soldier after soldier, bearing each one. And finally, as the sun streaked through the morning sky, he had that last soldier buried. And he got down on his knees and he said a little prayer. He said, please, please don't haunt me anymore. imagination that date back through all cultures to the dawn of time. They were used to entertain children tucked safely in their beds at night. They were used to explain that which could not be explained through the science of the day. And they were used to make accounts of actual events a little more interesting. Webster's defines legend as a story coming down from the past, especially one being popular and regarded as historical, although not verifiable. The Washington County area is rich in such legends, 
handed down through the generations. These stories date back as far as the Civil War and before. Most are rooted in historical facts and are an invaluable tool for a rich, clear understanding of our ancestors and their daily lives. Let us explore this unique oral history of our community. Let's unlock the door to our past. Nineteen ninety two marks the anniversary of two historic communities in Washington County. Boonesboro, my home, which is two hundred years old, and the neighboring community of Funkstown, which is two hundred twenty five years old. Both of these communities, with their various cultures and influences, have yielded many superstitions and tales that spark the imagination. It's here in Funkstown where we'll begin our first story along the banks of the Antietam Creek, whose waters hold the mystery of the Indian Maiden. When I was in my early school years, when I was nine, eight, nine, there was an old gentleman who lived adjacent to the school who would take the time to talk to children. And he started this story about this Indian maiden who in September, about the middle of the month, always came up the Antietam Creek in her canoe looking for her white boyfriend who was run off by her parents. This story was discussed between the kids in school bunch of stuff. Didn't happen. Garbage. So I talked to Mr. Kaufman. I guess the man was in his late 80s. And <clears throat> the more we talked, the more I was convinced that he was telling the truth. So he told me that on such and such a night, if I came down of course, this never happened except at midnight. If I came down, he would show me this Indian maiden on the creek, and I came down. Now, I'm sure I didn't have my parents' permission. I just have a hunch. At eight or nine, I was allowed out at midnight. I came down, met him, and his land adjoined the creek. We walked from his house back to the creek and sat along the bank. And it was warm days and cool nights. And you could see the mist coming off the creek. And he kept telling me that if I watched the, thir the middle arch of the bridge, I would see her come paddling out of the mist and up the creek. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, she would never come as far as his property. She came up to a point and turned around and went back. And he talked this to me for half three quarters of an hour. And then he said, see, here she comes. And I did see her. Now I realize that probably wasn't true. But Mr. Kaufman convinced me that I saw this Indian maid with long black hair, very dark eyes, beautiful young girl. No one will ever convince me I didn't see her. Turner's Gap is the home of the old South Mountain Inn. Today, it's one of the area's finest restaurants. But during the Battle of South Mountain, it served as headquarters for Confederate General D.H. Hill. The fighting at Turner's Gap between Hill's division and federal troops under the command of General Ambrose Burnside never quite made it to the Mountain House. Instead, the fighting was concentrated to the northeast around Frost Town and eastward down the Frederick County side of South Mountain. Well, late in the day, uh, probably around about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the Federal First Corps arrived in the field, having traveled the distance from Frederick to uh, Turner's Gap along the National Road. Once they got here, they struck off north uh, towards the Frost Town uh, Road and the Frost Town Gap uh, further north. The idea was they were trying to perform what's called a double envelopment of the Confederate line, which is basically like trying to put them between two pinchers and squeezing the line together. Uh, First Corps traveled north, of course, up towards the uh, Frost Town Gap. When they got into that area, there was very few Confederates in front of them. In fact, there was only about uh, 1,200 Confederate soldiers of the 12th Alabama, commanded by uh, Robert Rhodes. Uh, as the Federals started their attack up through that area then, again, there was very few Confederates, but they were able to use the terrain features, use the rocks, stone walls, and things like that to their uh, effectiveness and help to hold up the Federals as much as they could. Eventually, of course, just sheer weight of numbers, uh, Federals were able to finally gain the top of the mountain, caught the, uh, the Confederate left flank, and then started pushing them back towards Turner's Gap. It was about this time that Longstreet's command, the rest of his command, which had been in Hagerstown at the start of the battle, came all the way down to the mountain. They arrived at the mountain house and were immediately set out in front of the Federal attack. Uh, they were able to put up enough defense that the uh, Federals lost steam, and darkness fell on the battlefield, ending the fighting for that part. By nightfall on September 14th, the Confederates still held the ground at Turner's Gap, but the losses on both sides were devastating. Later that night, the entire Confederate Army retreated down the west side of South Mountain into Sharpsburg. The next day, the old South Mountain Inn, back then called the Mountain House, was turned into a hospital for the wounded on both sides. The Mountain House is one of the oldest structures in Washington County. Its history has been traced back to the 18th century. Over the years, historians have debated the actual date the old stone house was built, but all agree that the building in some form was constructed between 1700 and 1732. The old South Mountain Inn was one of the first frontier dwellings that extended into the dangerous Indian Territory. Back then, Alternate Route 40 was just a mere pathway through the mountain gap that people would use to reach the frontier to trade with the Indians. It is believed by some that there was already an inn or trading post at this location when the area was first surveyed in 1730 by Arthur Nelson. Then in 1750, Robert Turner bought the land and named the Mountain Gap after himself. It is thought that Turner built the stone house we know of today as a home for his family. Building the stone house certainly wasn't an easy task. The shoulder of the mountain was dug out to make room for the house. The stone, which makes up the walls, was excavated by hand from the ridge and dragged by ox and sledge to the building site. All of the wood used in building the house was from trees felled on the mountainside. Some of the trees can even be seen in the cellar. They are the whole trunks laid as floor joists with the bark still on them. Around the turn of the century, Robert Turner sold the house to John Carey and Jacob Young. 
Historians have found evidence that shows Jacob Young was an innkeeper, so it is widely accepted that he and John Kerry turned the mountain house into an inn for weary travelers who passed through Turner's Gap. By 1790, there was no question that the mountain house was a full-fledged inn, and by 1805, the road in front of the inn had grown from a small footpath to the National Road. The National Road connected Baltimore with the Mississippi River. Today, we know that stretch from Baltimore to Cumberland as alternate Route 40. With the construction of the National Road, the mountain house began to thrive. By 1810, the road was completed from Baltimore to Boonesboro and from Boonesboro to Hagerstown by 1820. It was not unusual for 18 to 20 coaches to pass the South Mountain Inn each day. But in 1862, the Civil War came to the doors of the old South Mountain Inn. By nightfall on September 14th, approximately 4,000 men had become casualties of the fighting on the mountain that day. When the Federal Army took possession of the mountain house the next day, they found the house ransacked and abandoned except for the wounded that lay inside the house and on the surrounding grounds. The inn had been turned into a makeshift hospital, as many of the homes and barns were on that September day. The inn would see the wounded once again after the Battle of Antietam. The many ambulance wagons that passed the inn on their way to Baltimore and Washington would frequently stop for a drink of water from the well or a brief respite from the jostling of the road. The inn would change hands again shortly after the end of the Civil War. Then, in 1876, ownership of the inn was purchased by Madeline Dahlgren, who turned it into her private summer residence. Madame Dahlgren is best remembered by the stone chapel she had built across the street from the inn, as well as her novel entitled South Mountain Magic. In this book, Mrs. Dahlgren collected the accounts of superstitions and legends surrounding the area of South Mountain, near the Mountain House. During her ownership of the Mountain House, Mrs. Dahlgren had several strange occurrences happen. One occurrence happened to two of Mrs. Dahlgren's prominent social guests who were staying at her house one Halloween night. Thank you once again for a lovely evening, Madeline. The dinner was superb as always. So delighted you liked it. Well, thank you. Don't you agree, Raymond? Yes, it was a wonderful evening. I'm so glad you could make it. Well, it's been, it's getting awfully late. I think we should turn in. Good night. Gentlemen, if you'll follow me, I'll show you to your room. Later that night, one of the men awoke to a strange smell. He got out of bed, went to the window, and noticed smoke emanating from the woods near the house. He quickly went and woke his friend and told him of the smell and smoke. Ray, Raymond, wake up. Do you smell something? Yeah, what is it? I have no idea. It's throughout the entire house. I think it's coming from outside. It's going to be Thompson. Yes, that's an excellent idea. The man and his friend did what cultivated men do. They awoke one of Mrs. Dahlgren's hired hands. Thompson, wake up. Wake up, man. We need you to go outside. There's this horrible odor in and a fog. Fog? Mountain fog? I don't know what kind of fog. Just get out of bed and go check. Thank you, sir. Hurry up, man. Don't take all night. Yes, sir. Right, the top's in here. You might want to take this with you. Yes, sir. Hurry along, Thompson. Ray, get the door for him. Now, go out there and see what you can see and report back to us. Now, let's go upstairs to the observatory and see what we can see from that view. The two gentlemen climbed to the top of the observatory, which sat in the eastern side of the house. The man investigated much of the property. Well, Thompson. Sirs, there is nothing out there. Good night. Nothing out there. We'll check it out for ourselves, won't we? Come along. Then, shortly after midnight, the two men witnessed something that would remain a legend to this day. 
Incredibly, the smoke took form, and before any of the gentlemen could react, the apparitions of two armies began to converge around the grounds of the inn. The two men recognized the uniforms of the two armies, those belonging to the Confederate States of America and the Federal Army. The sounds of the battle swelled and echoed through the mountain pass. The men knew they were witnessing a ghostly reenactment of the Battle of South Mountain right before them. The distinguished gentlemen quickly retreated and sought shelter in their beds. As quickly as they had appeared, the two armies and the pitched sounds of battle faded away, never to be seen or heard again to this day. Another occurrence happened while Mrs. Dahlgren and a friend were shopping in Frederick. She and her friend were dining in the ladies' lounge at the City Hotel. Thank you so much for helping me pick this hat out, Lydia. I love it. It's so pretty. It'll look so nice in the springtime. Do you find it rather warm in here all of a sudden? No, not at all. Do you feel all right, Madeline? Yes. I just have a strange feeling there's something wrong at home. Do you mind riding at nighttime? Not at all, no. Oh, Lydia, we must get home. When Mrs. Dahlgren walked into the house, she was greeted by her anxious family and servants. They told her a strange story that occurred after they had finished dining. The entire family had retired to a room which opened to the outside. Suddenly, they heard something enter through the front door and make its way into the dining room. The frightened witnesses heard the distinct clatter of hooves as the sound made its way from the dining room to the kitchen. It ascended the main staircase and finally faded away as it entered the attic. Mrs. Dahlgren wrote of several other stories in her book, South Mountain Magic. That book, in fact, is available in the Washington County Library. After Mrs. Dahlgren's tenure, the old mountain house was returned to service as an inn and passed through several owners through the early part of the 20th century. Today, the old South Mountain Inn is proudly owned by Chad and Lisa Dorsey. Both of the Dorseys had worked at the inn for many years before purchasing it. I uh, started back here when I was 18, just out of school, needed a job, started here as a bus person. Um, did that for about a year. Uh, a lot of my friends were back in the kitchen working, was hanging out back there more than I should have been, uh, got in a little trouble, and then uh, decided to get a job back in the kitchen. And the chef asked me if I wanted to be a, a dishwasher for extra money, so did that. He saw how quick that worked, moved from dishwasher to basically prep cook, line cook, that's where I met Chad. And then kind of come up to here to help him out a little bit on the holidays and on the weekends when you needed some help. And every other weekend became every weekend. And then it used to came during the week and, you know, it was more progressive. Every time he'd need help, he would call me and I'd come up and help him. Just started learning from the chef and he put me on the line and basically become, became his sous chef. And after that, um, things just came around that uh, they asked me to become the chef. Took the job. Uh, worked under the old owners for about eight years, and my wife and I had a good uh, chance to buy the restaurant. Things have quieted down quite a bit over the past few decades at the old South Mountain Inn. The events that occur aren't as spectacular as they were in Madame Dahlgren's day, but the things that do happen are just as eerie. One of the old cleaning ladies that were, was here probably back in the early 90s said she was here uh, she used to be here like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. She actually left her job that night and did not come back. It really freaked her out. She did return uh, a couple days later, but it really shook her up, and she wasn't one to make stories up. She had worked here for 
I believe it's 12 years prior to that, never had, you know, any stories to tell, but that was one story that, uh, you know, stuck in my mind. It's widely believed that one of the spirits that still haunts the old South Mountain Inn is none other than Mrs. Madeline Dahlgren herself. The old mountain house and the area around South Mountain played quite an impact on Madame Dahlgren's life. So it's no wonder that the people who still work at the inn feel her spirit. Lisa Dorsey tells the story of one of her employees named George, who perhaps felt too much of the spirit of Madame Dahlgren. He had said one day, he was back in the kitchen, he was just being obnoxious, and he was taunting Lady Dahlgren, basically, was what it boiled down to. I'm telling you guys, no such thing as ghosts. What about Russ? He said he saw something upstairs last night. Yeah, right, whatever. I don't believe Russ one day. He said he saw some, like, old lady walk around upstairs. Yeah, she was probably lost. She was probably trying to find the back. Somebody said he could see through her. I mean, you don't think it was like Madeline Dahlgren's ghost or something? No, I do not think it was Madeline Dahlgren's ghost. Besides, once you're dead and buried and gone, you're not coming back no matter what. I don't believe in ghosts, man. I'm telling you, once you're dead and gone, you're never coming back no matter what. Man, I would be making her mad. She may do something to you. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd like to see that old broad do something to me. I dare that old broad to do something to me. I'd like to see that old broad do something to me. <laughs> So he swears that that was what it was. It was because he was taunting Lady Dahlgren in a mean fashion that she kind of said, well, do it to me, I'll do it to you. And then I had another young lady that worked here. She was walking through the pantry. In the same area, called the cage room because of the storage containers, other employees have reported strange instances, such as one employee who went in to get bar towels from one of the storage units. When he looked up, he was startled by a reflection of a woman in the glass window in the room. He told me it was an you know, old lady with gray hair and she had like a blue, old blue royal uh, dress on. Another employee went down to take inventory of the items in the room. As he walked in with his inventory sheet, he remembered that he had forgotten something to write with. Hey blue, you got that? He laid the paper down and went back to the bar to get a pen. The bartender searched everywhere for the sheet of paper, but couldn't find it. All right, who's messing with me? Did another employee come into the room and take the paper? Or was it someone or something else. Some dinner guests have reported even seeing a ghostly apparition in one of the upstairs dining rooms, aptly called Lover's Lane. Before the patio was added on here, the, the garden room, apparently, and this was another story that I was told by a previous owner, that that was like Lady Dahlgren's widow peak. You know, years back when the, when the widows were waiting for the sailors, they would pace that. And I've heard a lot of stories about people that have been here that have felt her presence in Lover's Lane because that's where she paced back and forth waiting for her husband. More sightings of ghostly shapes have been seen in other portions of the second story. The old secretary, probably back 92, 93. Um, I was down in the kitchen doing my normal thing in the morning. Old South Mountain Inn, how can I help you? Okay. Sure. Okay, you're all set. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7. Okay, bye. <gasps> Were you just upstairs? 
downstairs? What? I thought it was just you messing with me. No, I've been out in the kitchen all the time. I saw some, something white out of the corner of my eye. You all right? I think I just saw a ghost. And she stayed with me by my side until uh, the old owner's Russian Judy got here because she, she swore that I was up there messing with her. She said she could hear footsteps, the doors were opening and closing, and she said that she thought she saw me come around the corner in my white chef outfit, which I didn't even have it on that day. Finally, sightings of ghostly apparitions haven't been limited to the humans who work at the Old South Mountain Inn. My dog have a uh, Labrador and I had it brought him to work with me one day and I was uh, on the phone in one of my uh, offices upstairs and he was laying in the, uh, the hallway there and there's a, of course there's a window back behind me and he's sitting there staring at me and I'm on the phone and next thing you know I look over and his hair standing straight up and his ears go back. I'm thinking, you know, someone's outside on the ladder, my maintenance man. Then he starts, he starts barking like there's something wrong. He jumps up in my lap like he's scared. And I turned around and looked to see what was going on. And I just, I felt like there was some, a presence behind me. I didn't know what it was, but, you know, I, I hear that animals have this strange uh, sense of knowing that there, there's something else beyond, you know, us there. So that was, that was quite, a, quite a feeling that day to have that happen. The old stone house, which sits on top of Turner's Gap, certainly has seen its share of history in its more than 250 years. Could it be that some of the history associated with the old South Mountain Inn is still trapped in some way within its walls? One thing is for certain. If you come to eat in one of the inn's many dining rooms, there is a slight chance you might be witness to some of the same people who enjoyed a hot meal and relaxing drink long ago. These stories that you've seen are just a small representation of the legends and strange occurrences in our area. These are stories passed down through the years, from family to family. Some still swear to their authenticity, while others dismiss them as merely entertaining stories. Myths and legends are critical to every society. That, uh, in essence, myths, religions, uh, legends, Anything that can be used to explain the unexplainable becomes a central focus of many, many societies. Uh, obviously, in our very earliest societies where mankind knew almost nothing, uh, magic and myth and legend and religion became central to explain all sorts of things. Well, to me, legends are very important. Um, I'll explain that in just a minute. I think a legend itself, though, is probably a story that's unusual in its beginning. And then it gets told to someone else, and then that person embellishes it when they tell it to the third person. And then the story gets retold and maybe printed and then retranslated, and it goes back and forth. So uh, some months, uh, years later, that story is now completely different from what it was originally. But always at the center of the story, there's some truth. And I think it's important for the historians to take a look at legends and myths and and try to cut through all, all the various uh, details that, that don't seem real and try to get to that, that particular story and, and find out the exact truth. And by then, uh, when you get down to that one part of it that's true, uh, you can find the real story and it might be something very interesting, very beneficial. Legends, legends are our folklore. Uh, they're sort of like the fabric that, that binds us together um, as a society. You know, it, it, it's, it's a common uh, part of our common ancestry. And you know, one of the things that's always fascinated me about Washington County and Western Maryland is the local history and the legends. And, uh, you know, they just, you don't have to travel far, you know, to be there. And to be actually standing at a spot like Fox's Gap and, you know, to, to have this, this great legend, uh, it, it, I just find it amazing. Legends are, are one of those kind of things that, uh, if, if nothing else, it piques people's interest. Uh, it gets their attention, they hear the story, and through that means, uh, hopefully, they will visit the site. While they're here, then again, hopefully, they'll get the rest of the story and find out more about the importance and the significance of the battlefield. It's interesting to note that in most legends, there's always a ghost lurking in the background. Tales of ghosts and the supernatural have been with us for centuries. European settlers brought with them their fear of ghosts and their superstitions when they came to the New World. 
what exactly is a ghost? Some believe that it's a soul trapped between the living world and the afterlife. Others believe it's energy from an event that's imprinted forever in the fabric of time, while others think that ghosts are energies transmitted by the living. No matter what you believe, ghost stories will always be a part of our culture and our lives, with the one thing that ties them all together, the history of our community. So now, when you drive past that old house on your way to work, will you think about the history surrounding it? Or the next time you feel a cold breeze that chills your spine, or hear sounds behind you that make you spin around only to see a cloud of mist, will you dismiss it as you've done before? Or will a vague, uneasy feeling that you might not be alone come over you? Maybe there's a legend there. Cheney House, now Roos Antiques, is one of the older houses in Funkstown. It was built in 1820 and was used as a makeshift hospital during the Civil War, after the Battle of Funkstown, which took place July 10th, 1863. Many soldiers were brought here, wounded in desperate need of care, and many died here and were buried on the grounds. It wasn't long afterward that stories began circulating throughout the town about the strange happenings within Cheney House. Well, the Cheney House um, was built in 1820, and it was owned by uh, Dr. Cheney. It was a private residence up until about the Civil War when the Battle of Funkstown occurred, and they turned the house into a hospital. And legend goes that um, many soldiers had their limbs amputated and many soldiers died right in this spot. Our family purchased a house in 1942. I was born here, and I've, up until about 20 years ago, I lived here all my life where we've operated this business. Um, it's been a good house, but growing up, I was always told by the neighbor next door that the house was haunted. And I can remember coming home and afraid to go to bed, and my mother would be so upset with this neighbor because she was telling me all of the ghost stories of the house. And one of the legends uh, is that there was a ghost, and it was a woman, and she used to play the piano at midnight. And the lady who owned the house said, at midnight, the piano played. And then she'd tell me other things that would happen upstairs, and, and I was really frightened. And my parents always said, there's no ghost, there's no ghost. But I, of course, I didn't really believe them. Um, years went by, and I forgot all about it. And as I said, I lived here most of my life. We've operated this business. And one afternoon, um, a lady who worked here said, Carol, I've got to talk with you. And she said, I just saw the ghost. I saw the ghost that they've always talked about. And I said, oh, Jesse. She says, don't tell your mother. 
don't tell your mother. And it occurred upstairs. And Jesse said I was washing dishes and I felt this, this funny feeling over my shoulder. And I, and I looked over my shoulder and she said, here was a silhouette of a lady. Uh, and she had a Civil War dress on, and I thought right away she's a nurse. And she had her hair up in a bun. Um, she never said a word. She just looked at me. And she even had the apron, long sleeves. And she, it was a Civil War nurse, and then she vanished. <laughs> I've uh, been with uh, uh, Rue Saint-Tique for approximately uh, 40 years with her father and with them with Carol. And while well, in the early earlier times, uh, they had a, a lady by the name of Mrs. Grove, and she was often told me maybe a half a dozen times about the the ghost that was uh, supposedly uh, been in the house that she was referring to. Yes. And I used to, uh, at times, sort of kidding. She had a real sense of humor. And she was very sincere and a religious lady. And I would walk up behind her when she was busy doing something in her little workshop. And I would tap her on the shoulder. And she would suddenly rebound and look around with an astonished look on her face and her hand would go to her mouth and she'd say, oh, Paul, don't scare me like that. I thought that was the ghost here that was, it's in the house. And I would laugh and shrug it off. And then later on when uh, Carol, the incident that Carol was talking about, Mrs. Grove would always say, see, I told you there was a ghost in here, in this house. And that was the one story. And then the other uh, story was of the house of the piano. It used to sit here in the big front room when the people before uh, Mr. Beckley and his wife bought the house, they had a big spinet piano that sit in the front room here and uh, her uh, Mrs. Spindaprock's daughter would tell at times she would tell my wife and tell the other girls my wife happened to be the same age and play with her and they would come up on a Friday and Saturday evening here in this big room and they'd have the children when they was going to high school and they'd have dances and her mother would play the piano over there, and after everything had quieted down early in the morning, uh, Peg, which was uh, Mrs. Spencerock's daughter, would often say uh, she would hear that piano playing, and there was nobody. Everybody was in bed, and it would wake her up. And uh, it just seems, I don't know whether people believe in ghosts or anything, but uh, I have every reason to believe, without a doubt in my mind, that uh, somewhere, somewhere, there could have, this story could have been true. And I don't think that Mrs. Grove or Peg Finnefrock were the type of people that would exaggerate. And if you knew Jesse, uh, you would know that Jesse really believed what she saw. And I thought, oh, can't be true. But at the same time, I, I really did respect Jesse, and I knew that Jesse was not superstitious, but I forgot all about it. And, oh, about five years later, we had a set of banquet tables, just like these. In fact, they were identical to these. And a lady came in from Nevada, and she purchased the banquet tables. But we had to ship the tables. Now, the banquet tables set right in this spot. Um, and, of course, this is the spot where many men died.
after she purchased the, uh, the tables, we had to crate the tables. We built a big wooden crate, um, placed the tables in the crate, and shipped them to Nevada. She called and said the tables arrived safely, and she placed them in her dining room. Uh, six months later, she called, and she said, our life has never been the same, that we sent her a ghost. And I, I just laughed. I, I really laughed. I said, oh, I don't believe this. And she started telling me the antics of this ghost. So over the next year, we had quite a dialogue going. And she said, all kinds of things disappear. And we can't find them. And we, you know where we find them? We find them under the banquet table. She said, we bought a sideboard. And we placed it in a dining room. And the clevises disappeared from the sideboard or from the table, and we found them in the sideboard. And she said, well, we didn't think anything about it. Suddenly, the clevises disappeared again, and they were under the table. And I said, do you have children that are playing games with you? She said, no, they're all toddlers. There's no way that they're playing games. And then she talked about uh, the baby quieting down, and she'd run up in a room, and she'd see the rocker going back and forth. And finally, they decided that this ghost was a friendly ghost, and they got used to her. Unless something would disappear, they'd say, where is, you know, where is it? And it would, uh, it would arrive under the banquet table. Uh, when this table came to us, we were living in Reno, 1980. Uh, again, a beautiful table. It was welcomed into the home. And all was well until one afternoon when I was sitting downstairs and I heard someone walking the hallway upstairs. Well, I was supposedly home alone with my two dogs. The two dogs immediately looked up the stairs, started to wag their tails, and they ran up. Well, I thought my husband was home. He somehow snuck in. Well, went up to investigate. There was no one there. And I thought, how peculiar this is. Strange, but again, did not think ghost. I mean, who would? So I went downstairs, started to read my paper again. The same thing happened. So three consecutive times I heard footsteps down the hallway. And it wasn't just one or two. It was the whole length of the hallway. Well, I grabbed the poker and went upstairs to investigate. Nothing was there. I looked under beds, in shower stalls, everywhere. There was no one there. And yet the dogs are wagging their tails. So I thought, oh, who knows what's going on? That was basically the first incident we had, and again, did not think ghost. We were ready to move in August of 81 to Phoenix, which we did. Everything was moved and uh, had a wonderful home here in Phoenix. The table, the way the table is made, there are clamps holding pieces of the table together, different sections of the table. So I packed these carefully with my silver, not wanting to lose them. These were irreplaceable. And uh, my husband and I both decided we would hand carry the clamps with the silver. We did that. When we arrived in Phoenix, the silver was there, but the clamps were missing. And we couldn't figure that out. And again, did not think ghost. We just thought, well, something happened in the move. Who knows? So from basically August to November, we had no clamps for the table. In November, we had the whole family for Thanksgiving, and we're talking about all of the strange little things that have happened to us. Uh, things disappearing. Again, odd things. A bathrobe, slippers, a purse. Uh, again, all chalked up to being absent-minded on our part. But then someone brought up the notion. They were teasing. They said, oh, you've got a spook. You've got a haint. And we thought, no, this is ridiculous. Not in Arizona. There's nothing old in Arizona. You know, we don't have a ghost. Well, the next morning, this is again the day after Thanksgiving, I go to put my, my silver away, and there in the drawer are these clamps. And that startled me, needless to say. I uh, thought how peculiar, and my first thought was someone's playing a trick on me. Well, we talked to everyone, and everyone assured us that no one had a play in this. And from that point on, I started to think spirit. Uh, we had a kitchen door, for example, that was a, a very odd kitchen door. It was very hard to close. You really had to bang this thing closed. It would open on its own. I would be waiting for my husband to come home in the evening in bed watching Johnny Carson. Uh, he would get home very late, 
And I would, oh, I would, I think, oh, there's John. I hear the, the kitchen door opening and closing. Well, I'd wait for him to return to the, to the bedroom. No, John. No, John. I'd go and investigate. The car was not in the garage, and the the door was locked, just like it should have been. And I thought, God, I know that door opened because again, the squeak and the the groan it would give, I could hear it all the way in the back of the house. So this went on for months. This door opening and closing. And I thought I was going mad. Well, one day I'm standing at my sink and peeling carrots. And I definitely felt the strangest sensation. Someone was standing behind me. I whirled around and there was no one, absolutely no one. And yet this this, uh, overpowering presence was there. I had goosebumps. I was frightened. I couldn't breathe. And it was so fast. Uh, it, I, I yelled, I screamed out loud. And then I thought, oh, you know, I'm losing it. Something's wrong with me. This is ridiculous. Turned around, started peeling my carrots again. The same thing happened, only this time it was behind my neck. It was closer. And I whirled around again, holding my peeler as my weapon. No one was there. But that was the first contact we had with what I now call Sadie. I still didn't believe her until she called and she said, we saw our ghost. And I said, you saw the ghost? And she said, yeah. I said, describe it. And she said, Carol, the ghost is wearing a dark dress. And she described this very tight silhouette. And she said, it reminds me of a Civil War nurse. Well, my heart just started pounding. I said, how did she wear her hair? She said, up in a bun. And she had on a white apron, long sleeves. She described the ghost that Jesse had described. We were watching television, and I walked from the the family room into the kitchen area, uh, going to get a drink of water, something as simple as that, and walked through a mist, a cool, damp mist. There is no way in the house that we live in. Again, Arizona is a very dry, dry, uh, has a dry climate. You're not going to find mist in your home. And yet, in that, that, that second I passed through this mist, I had a mental image of this entity, this spirit. It was definitely female. I saw that she was wearing long sleeves, a uh, uh, floor-length dress. The fabric was very coarse. It was almost a gray in color, maybe a, an off-green or something, very dark uh, color. Apron front. She wore her hair tightly pulled back, um, held, she had a bun on the top of her head, uh, and I knew she was Sadie. In that second, I knew. And also what came through was that she was somehow gentle, kind, not to be feared, more of a, um, a caretaker, if you will. The children love her. The, sh- the children say she's with them all the time. And finally, the husband said, that's it. I've had enough. There's no ghost in this house. Forget it. And she said, a cantaloupe went flying across the room and turned upside down, just through midair. So now Sadie exists. I believe it. We all believe it. But the ghost is no longer with us, and we miss her. This whole area of South Mountain, all around Zittlestown and Washington Monument, has long been known about the tales of ghosts and strange happenings here. Probably this can be explained by the fact that South Mountain is the site of a bloody battle of the Civil War, and all battlefields have their share of ghosts. Now, as you know, in 1827, the citizens of Boonesboro marched up the top of South Mountain at this whole area of the Blue Rocks, and in one day, they constructed the first monument in the nation to George Washington. But for some unknown reason, 
years later, the entire top of that stone monument just came tumbling right down. The whole top just fell off. Now, soon after this strange occurrence, this whole area of the Blue Rocks got a sinister reputation of harboring evil spirits. People said that if you came here, just as dusk fell on the earth, and you listened, you would hear strange noises. There would be screams and moans, all of these sounds. It was so scary. Some people said that it was, the sobs were like there was some baby or some young girl lost in the woods, couldn't find her way. Other people said there were shrieks and there were all these moans and groans as if somebody was hurt very badly and needed help. It became so scary that anybody in his right mind would never come at the Blue Rocks after dark. On the day before the Battle of Antietam, this whole area was just swarming with Confederate soldiers. They were everywhere. They were camping in the woods. They were all along the roads, among the rocks. It was unbelievable that the number that was actually right here. Some of these soldiers knew that the battle was inevitable, probably the next day, and so they were doing all kinds of things in preparation. Some of the soldiers were gathered around a well at the home of a Zittlestown farmer. And they were filling their canteens with water. Now it so happened that this farmer had a lovely young daughter named Lucinda. And she was caught up in all of this activity. She had never seen this many soldiers in all her life. And she was standing right there beside the well, helping those soldiers fill their canteens. And as one soldier stepped forward, his name was Simon. He was a very young soldier, probably no more than 16. And he looked up and he saw the beauty of that girl. And all of a sudden, he thought to himself, I would give my very life for somebody as beautiful as she. They were in love. At least they thought they were in love which is sometimes the same thing, and sometimes it's even better. Well, they had the rest of the day together, and they made the most of it. But the next day, there was a horrific battle that took place on South Mountain. And all day long, Lucinda was worried. What had happened to Simon? Was he killed? Was he laying out in the battlefield wounded? Somehow, somehow, he got through that battle out of scratch. And they were so happy together. Then Simon told her that the Confederates had planned that evening in darkness to retreat and go to Sharpsburg. And she knew that if they separated, they would never see each other again. And she begged Simon. She said, desert that rebel army. Stay here with me. Let's spend a life together. Well, it didn't take too much convincing for Simon because he was in love with that Zittletown Bell. But he was scared because he knew if he were caught as a deserter, he would be hanged. But Lucinda had an idea. She said, in the area of the Blue Rocks, there are a lot of caves. And everybody's scared to go to the Blue Rocks because that's haunted. We'll hide you in one of those caves. Nobody will ever dare to go there. That's what they did. He hid one of the caves at the Blue Rocks. The next day, his comrades had all retreated to Sharpsburg, and he was missing. Find 
And they thought, poor Simon, he was probably killed on the battlefield. They knew he was such a good soldier, he would never desert. They didn't know that he was with his sweetheart and they were planning their life together. Well, two days later, there was a bloody battle that took place at Sharpsburg. The Battle of Antietam was only one day long, but there were over 23,000 soldiers that fell. Three of the comrades of Simon were killed. And they turned into spirits. And as spirits, they knew everything. They knew immediately that Simon had deserted. He had skedaddled with his girlfriend and left them to fight the war. They were enraged. They were so mad. And the spirits, in vapor like, they just swished right through the air to South Mountain, to the area of these blue rocks. And there, on one of the big flat rocks, Simon and Lucinda were sitting there holding hands so deeply in love. They were so enraged, and with their supernatural powers, they caused the entire stone monument to just topple over on that couple. Miraculously, that couple wasn't killed. They were saved by being in a crevice in those rocks, but there were tons and tons of boulders. They were completely entombed. They thought they were going to die together. But Lucinda said, there's all of these neighbors around the Blue Rocks. We'll yell for help, and they'll come, and they'll dig us out. I know they will. They called, and they cried, and they sobbed. Those people heard them, but they didn't come because they said, Aha, I know. Those are some of those evil spirits, and they're trying to entice us to come to the Black Rocks. No way. They didn't come. So that poor couple, entombed in agony, and starving. Finally, finally, after a month, they welcomed death together. Now, it is said that if you come to this area of the Blue Rocks on the eve of the Battle of South Mountain, just as dusk settles on the mountainside, if you listen carefully, if you listen carefully, you can hear the news and the groans of that couple, as entombed in there for eternity, they're still crying for help in their agony. And if you dare, dare to climb down onto the blue rocks and go to that area where they're entombed, and you look closely, you will actually see the scratch marks on the face of that cave where Lucinda was frantically clawing, trying to save herself. Now, I've told you that story just the way it was told to me. That's the reason why Washington's monument suddenly came tumbling down. We own uh, the, our ground went about halfway through the morning, man, where the morning men's are setting. We we uh, at one time we owned half the morning men. We didn't know it, but the the, uh, the line went right through it. It set on between two lines. Morning men already had a crack in it, and people thought it was a big thunder lightning thunderstorm hit it. But years come on, come to find out. At farmers over in Frederick County side had a bunch of daughters. They was using that there for good picnic grounds. So as one farmer told his daughter what was going to happen if they didn't stay away from it. So he followed them over one night and he got over there. The girls wasn't there, but he threw them one in to charge of dynamite. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, 
and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.